Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and welcome to part two of my interview with Mark Levy. Mark, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and um, uh, we had an interview with Mark uh, a little while back, part one. And uh, just to uh, recap, um, Mark is a, a writer, uh, lives in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, he is a Vietnam combat veteran. Uh, he served as a medic around 69, 70 in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in Vietnam. And uh, he uh, started suffering from uh, PTSD after the war, and he still suffers from PTSD, uh, which we mentioned last time, uh, about 50 years ago when he uh, was out of the service, uh, the term wasn't even in, 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 in use then. Uh, and um, uh, Mark relayed how he, he had trouble uh, dealing with his own symptoms because he didn't know what it was and the doctors didn't know what it was. He couldn't even communicate with his family because they didn't know what was going through his mind. But uh, ultimately, uh, Mark turned to writing uh, as a, a cathartic way to deal with his uh, trauma. And so we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to continue our conversation from last time. Anything you want to add to that, Mark? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Uh, you know, last time we, we talked about the fact that at some point uh, after uh, your service, uh, you, you traveled very extensively all over, all over the world. Uh, and I want to just kind of get back to that, um, uh, sort of what, what was your intent uh, when, 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 you, when you were traveling. And also, you, you learned a couple of techniques that, that, um, that dealt with uh, um, PTSD, and, and maybe you could explain one of those that you, you had picked up in, in Australia. Uh, maybe you could, you could start there. Well, I, I left the country uh, the second time for an extended period uh, after burning out of New York as a social worker. So I had uh, gone to Central America for short periods of time with groups of this and then went on my own and eventually uh, found a place in Guatemala, lived there and used that as a base to travel. And uh, a year later, I left the country and lived in New Zealand and, and uh, saved up some money and, and traveled around Asia and so forth. And it was on the return from uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, all these places. Eventually, I thought, let me, let me check out uh, EMDR. It's a form of uh, hypnosis, but you're, you're conscious. And at the time, this is back in 90, uh, 94, it was in the news. It was a clinical tool. It was still unknown why it worked, but it had gotten some credibility for being a tool that assisted therapy. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, so I got on a bird uh, from, I think, uh, Bali, and I, I didn't really know where it was being taught. I just knew Australia. I didn't know that it was also <laughs> taught in the States, but I thought, why not? Because I, I had bought a one-way ticket eight months ago, and I, my time was my own. Uh, but I was, I, I was also suffering pretty badly from uh, flashbacks and anxiety because of my travels in Laos and these other places. Right. So... I got off the plane, I found a backpacker place to stay in Glebe, uh, uh, I think it was in a little town in Sydney, and then I walked around and found this old phone booth that had an old phone book, <laughs> and I thought, okay, let's look for uh, counseling, therapy, hypnosis, and I, you know, deduction, and, and I found this number. Wrong, it didn't work. Let's try it again. I tried it again, dropped some coins in the slot, talked to this guy named Alex, who happened to be the head of the EMDR people in, in Australia. And then I, he said, yeah, we, the next workshop is in a week. We're in Blackburn Hospital. So. And I went and took the course, a two-day course introductory. And basically the technique is you follow the therapist's hand going back and forth as he invokes a protocol. And you... He is not asking you any questions. He's just doing this. And for some reason, while he does this and just asks you to think about the things that bother you, 
He does that several times, and each time invoking the same protocol and then measuring your response, your feeling, your relief. And it, 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 it seems to work. And when we did it in this little introductory class, uh, first a student does it to you, and then you do it to the student. And it was a beautiful little location in the basement of a hospital, but it's mostly doctors and nurses. I'm the lone Vietnam vet social worker, uh, stressed out. Uh, and this nurse does it to me, and I do it to her. And then I get a lift back to the, the little uh, guest house in Glebe. And about three hours later, I felt like a lotus coming up out of the mud and blossoming. It was a really, really beautiful experience, feeling, state. And it, uh, it sustained for about 10 days. It's remarkable. Well, wow. yeah. and, and you and none of the PTSD symptoms that we talked about last time manifested during that that ten day period. Oh, it, was a, it was like a sustained period of well being. Wow. Yeah, no drugs, no alcohol, no nothing. Yeah, and so you never went back though. Well, that was a, a, just a little workshop. Yeah. Uh, when I got back to the states a couple of weeks later, uh, I was in bad shape and eventually wound up in a PTSD ward for seven weeks in Montrose, New York. And there the therapy was uh, a classic VA, fairly, in my opinion, remedial. Uh, so drugs and group therapy and occasionally seeing someone to talk to face to face. Yeah. The drugs had a negative effect and the therapy was helpful. But the model overall, you know, bossing guys around, uh, yelling at them. Uh, going from one room to the next every hour or two. Uh, yeah. That was hard. Mm -hmm. And I, I was able to complete the program, but, uh, and eventually found another VA therapist when I was living in New York. And, and uh, he was very good. He was fantastic Vietnam vet and uh, almost died in, in Vietnam. And I requested a, a, an EMDR therapist, and they had one, but we just didn't click, so it didn't work. So you never tried the EMDR therapy afterwards? Just that once and then Just never again. But, but based upon the fact where you said it was like 10 days of bliss, yeah. uh, I would, I would have, you, know, you would have think that you would have been like desperate to, to, to find someone else to, to, uh, and, and, and try this therapy again, but it never happened. Point taken, didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Now right now you told me uh, that um, you uh, are uh, on a program, and I read in the, in the news recently that that uh, ecstasy is being used in situations uh, li like yours. Can you explain, because uh, I think you are on a program right now, or on a volunteer uh, program right now? Well, the drug was criminalized about 40 years ago, so research that was going ongoing at the time was frozen. Mm -hmm. And it had therapeutic value then, mm -hmm. as did LSD and some of the other hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, and over the last, say, 15 years, uh, Certain researchers and organizations have been able to reinvigorate research into the therapeutic value of some of the hallucinogens. And the, the organization I'm familiar with is called MAPS, which is an acronym for what I forget. Mm -hmm. And they are supervised by the DEA and the FDA mm -hmm. and receive money from uh, private individuals. And I, I, I'm assuming they get some grants. Mm -hmm. And right now, after almost 10 years, they're into phase three clinical research. So they're projecting that if they uh, get government approval, the MDMA as an assisting tool in con uh, conventional therapy could be available for trained clinicians, trained in mm -hmm. the, the appropriate use of MDMA. It could be available you know, within the three to five years. Okay. And MDMA, for our viewers, is ecstasy, right? Or the version of ecstasy? It's ecstasy. Okay, it is ecstasy. And you are, you have had a couple of, of uh, trials with it yourself? I volunteered for a trial uh, about seven years ago, and I was accepted. So I flew down to South Carolina to meet the principal researchers, Mike and Annie Mithifer, and blood tests, interviews, and so on. And uh, I was still taking benzodiazepines at the time, and there's a lot of flying involved, and I just, uh, I couldn't deal with that, so I let it go. Yeah. Uh, I've been in touch with, 
the organization, periodically make donations, peri keep informed about the progress of the research. Uh, they're going to have more clinical trials in the f this summer around the country, and I'll be volunteering again, and hopefully I'll be accepted. Yeah. Okay, great. Now let's let's uh, uh, go back to to the book that we that we mentioned in in um, in part number one, um, uh, how Stevie nearly lost the war and other. Uh, they're all tilted this way, and um, the, the there's a lot of stories here. And we we mentioned last time that you use different names. Stevie Stevie is actually you, um, and um, uh, the. Um, uh, the, the interesting how Stevie nearly uh, uh, lost the war, uh, you would think that the war is a, a, a physical war, the, the battle, Vietnam War, but it's actually your battle, your, your personal battle and your, your, your trauma. Uh, talk a little bit about, about that. How, how did you choose that, that title? It just came to me in the, in the course of writing, and uh, it's Stevie... Uh, realizing that uh, in in that story uh, with Cindy, the, the title story, yeah, uh, my thought, my conscious thought is that uh, he doesn't want to one lose the war in terms of uh, losing Cindy. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to lose the war of trying to have a re a normal relationship with a woman. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I, um, I'm intrigued, and I like, I like the, um, the, um, uh, the camera to zoom in on the cover uh, once again, because I'm, I'm absolutely in, intrigued with this, with this, uh, with this cover, and um, the cover is actually uh, comes from a Greek, a form of Greek pottery which was called black figure vases. And this is actually Achilles and Ajax, and they're 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 it's a pause during the battle, their battles, and they're they're playing a kind of a, a board game. They might be playing chess or or something like that. Now I, I have another one. I'm going to put this down and bring up another uh, uh, picture. This is the actual. Um, this is the actual. It's, a, it's an amphora, and this is actually in the, uh, in the Vatican Museum. And you can see there the same image, although it's wrapped around. This amphora is actually, I think it's about 40 inches. It's about two to three feet. It's between two and three feet, close to three feet uh, tall. And that's, this is what they called Greek black figure uh, vases. And I'm going to put this down for uh, a second. And I also want to want to call our viewers' attention to there's something else uh, going on, on on the cover. And um, let me let me get another uh, picture ready here. Um, uh, don't tell me I didn't bring that. I did. It's back here. Okay. So, if um, I'm going to try to do this and see if I, if if you look, this is a picture, and I'm going to try to line these up. And if you look between the two figures, Ajax and Achilles, who were the two greatest warriors. Uh, of, of the Greeks, you see there's a, there's a person there with uh, his arms folded over his knees, and this is, this is that person, and that person is you. And um, that, that is absolutely intriguing to me, and I, I, I have to ask you um, about the design of the cover and where that came from and what, what the significance of that is, Mark. Yeah. Well, I was looking for something that would be atypical, and I like this kind of art. And I originally, my original design was to take Ajax and Achilles and uh, use the background of the photograph over myself, so that all you see from the, the Vietnam photo was just the, the foliage. Mm -hmm. And I liked it. But I gave it to the guy who developed my website, 
uh, who's a really good designer, strong background in graphic art, and I said, uh, what can you do with this? And his name is Casey Cole, and he's done work for the Peabody Essex. Mm -hmm. And he, he uh, kicked it around for a while. So that's his design. He really opened it up. He focused on the, the two colors and then opened up the top of the photograph. And that's his uh, design of his idea of putting me between those two guys. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm there, but you've got to look, otherwise you don't see it. Yeah. yeah and the other backstory is that uh, the, the platoon had been on patrol, and we put our stuff down. We're, we're on what's called a well-used trail. It's a very bad idea to sit. On a, yeah. You know, it's just, <laughs> I, if you're watching this at home, don't do that. <laughs> So, and, and, and the reason for that, obviously, is that that's where they might put the, the mines and the booby traps and, and, and things like that, because that's where you're going to be walking. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Now, um, uh, the, the, um, there was a, a recent article, and I'm going I'm to show it, I'm going to hold it up here. Um, a recent article in the Salem News that, um, and maybe you can zoom in on the... On the um, And, uh, okay, so it's Writers Workshop Let's Warriors Tell Their Stories. And this was about, what, a couple months ago? Maybe three months ago? No. Some, some, something like that. I think it was about the time where we did our, 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 our first show. And I'm going I'm to, you're, you're part of this, or you have been part of this Writers Workshop. Um, and um, uh, you, you, um, uh, are quoted in here as saying that um, that when these writers write, that this is my sense is that this is uh, uh, the tip of the iceberg. Um, so, so tell us about this writers group and your participation uh, in it. Well, I've known about it for a year or two, at least, and uh, through the vets agent uh, in Salem. Kim Emmerling, who was himself a, a Special Forces uh, veteran. And I made some inquiries, and it, it just wasn't getting off the ground. And then finally I got in touch with Tom Lay, I think it's Lasser. Mm -hmm. So uh, we connected, and um, what I learned later was it was just, he was having a hard time getting these guys to commit, these other vets, who were mostly Iraq and Afghanistan vets. To, to, uh, I think there was basically resistance on their part to come to terms with whatever it was that was kicking around inside them. So our first uh, formal meeting was, you know, around uh, early December, and we met, of all places, at the VFW in Salem. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that uh, having a couple of drinks uh, before a writers' group was not such a great idea. So the second meeting was held at Salem State when the paper showed up. The Salem News, and that was a a great meeting. And uh, in answer to the question, uh, you know, you, you go to war, you come back, and it changes you. And there's some things you just uh, deny or bury or don't want to deal with. So this one guy who was a Special Forces Vietnam vet, uh, I'm sorry, he was Special Forces around my age. I don't think he'd been to Vietnam, but he'd seen his share of whatever he did. So he related some stuff to a certain point because it sounded like he couldn't talk about it. Not so much emotionally, but it may have been stuff you can't talk about uh, from a governmental point of view. And so that was my comment, that he was sort of uh, walking around this stuff. And whether it was emotional or whether it was governmental, uh, it's like... It's, uh, it's down here somewhere. It's like you're the Titanic, figuratively, and the iceberg is here, and you're the iceberg, too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a, there's a convergence. There's a tension in that con uh, potential convergence. And that's where the story is. Because that's uh, a very good writer once said to a group that I was in, you know, face your dread. And you can say it in any number of ways, but that's, that's where the action is. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. And, and do, do you feel yourself uh, mirrored in, in some of the other um, participants in these, in these writers groups? Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. stages of writing and stages of facing your dread, stages of, uh, you know, just literacy, how much you, uh, what are you reading, how much you're reading, how much have you integrated your reading into your psyche, and how, how well are you along in integrating what you've read into what you're writing. Yeah. And, and do you see them like in different phases of their recovery, if that's the word, uh, the, 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 the proper word, that, that you went through? Do you, do you give them advice and, and do you say, gee, you know, I, I've been there? How, how does that work? I like being in the background. Uh -huh. So that's my role. And I'll just uh, say things and be supportive and try not to be uh, over encouraging, over yeah. avuncular. Just, I'm just there. Yeah, and you're quoted here as saying, it's a sense of community with all these people, and it feels right to be with other veterans. Because you know, even though they were, there's, uh, you say, are there people from, from the Vietnam War here? Mostly they're Iraq uh, uh, veterans and Afghanistan veterans? Yeah, I think uh, me and the other guy, we're the old men. Most of these, most of these guys are you know, 20, six, 27, maybe pushing 30. Yeah, and now, uh, Compared to how, uh, you know, you, you, you related last time that you didn't get much support from the official establishment, from, from the government or the VA, uh, but now, now that PTSD is a recognized sort of a, a, a recognized syndrome, uh, do you find that these folks are getting better treatment or uh, more effective treatment from, from these, these other sources, the government and, and, and caretakers? It depends on who you talk to, but from what I've read recently, there just aren't enough therapists, so you've got guys waiting. And it's not clear to me how, how um, successful the CHOICE program has been, red tape, mm -hmm. uh, where guys can see somebody outside the VA mm -hmm. for, and the VA reimburses that therapist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. My, my feeling is that therapy-wise, uh, the VA has publicly stated that they are uh, not behind medical marijuana, which is what a lot of guys from uh, Afghanistan and Iraq are using, legitimately. Not, you know, maybe, I think less for me recreational use and more for just to you know, abate their symptoms. Um, and personally, I think that uh, whether it's PTSD or uh, other you know, emotional problems, MDMA, which I, I suspect the VA will be resistant to. I'm not clear yet, but it, it, if, it, if they are the way they usually are, they, they'll be uh, possibly you know, years behind. And I think MDMA is going to be a real boost for a lot of people in, in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, we mentioned last time that you, you were actively involved in some, uh, just after your Fort Devens days in uh, anti-war activity and so forth. Are you still actively involved or just uh, mentally supportive of, of anti-war activity? How, what, what's your... What's your involvement these days? I was a longtime member of uh, Veterans for Peace in, uh, in Gloucester and Ipswich. So I'm sort of an honorary member. So I, t I attend some functions, occasionally go to a demonstration. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a longtime member of Vietnam Veterans Against the War, mm -hmm. and I'm a longtime member of, of Vietnam Veterans of America. Mm -hmm. ha have you have you written any articles specifically from from that that viewpoint as saying that as a, as a member of these organizations? Well, ironically, but uh, in terms of outing of a, a fake veteran who was a member of Veterans for Peace, and uh, I've written some stuff for Vietnam Veterans Against the War, mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, the articles that I've written for Counterpunch aren't necessarily uh, for any specific organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're just they're just your there's yeah. your, per, your your personal. Now I'd like you to uh, there's a, there's a, a piece that came in Counterpunch because we don't have that much. Time. I'd like you to to read that based upon what we were talking about the the um, uh, the the soldiers, regardless of the wars that they were in. Maybe you could read that for us. This is from a Counterpunch article in 2000 and. Six. So it's called uh, Whatever You Did in War Will Always Be With You. And it starts with a little quote, a joke. VA shrink, were you in Vietnam? Vietnam vet, yes. VA shrink, when were you there? Vietnam vet, 
last night. Then the article begins. I'm kneeling. Tears streak down my face, drip down, fall to earth. It's only my second time in combat. Soon I'll be different. Soon revenge for our dead and wounded will meld with fear, and I will help with the killing, and the killing will help me. We're just regular grunts. We make too much noise. We have no special skills. We're not elite. But after a time, we get the hang of this war, the rhythm of it. Wait, engage, disengage. We call it contact or movement. We psych ourselves up. Time to kick ass and take names, we say. And between contact and kicking ass or having our asses kicked, there is tension that starts small, then builds and builds until we secretly pray it will happen. That we walk into them or them into us or we mortar them or they rocket us, then the tension explodes like perfect sex and afterwards we're spent. There are days, weeks, nothing happens, then terror, instant and deep, then relief like paradise since the killing is done and we have buried away the wounded and dead until it starts all over again. That was 37 years ago. Or was it last night? A day, a year, 20 years home from war, you may begin to act strange. The shrinks, social workers, group therapists, clinical researchers, each has a different take on what causes PTSD. It's neurolinguistic, it's cognitive, it's biochemical. They chime and chatter. Who cares? Just stop the pain, just stop it. But where does that pain come from? What's going down? Here's what I know. What you learn in combat, you do not easily forget. You drop at the first hint of an ambush, falling so fast your helmet still spins in the air. You shoot first and ask questions later. The enemy is an unfeeling, slippery bug to be stomped out. You live like an animal. You learn to like killing. Learn to fear and hate the enemy, hate civilians, can't trust the bastards. You hate taking prisoners. You'd rather kill them. Why? Because the enemy wants to mess you up, kill you, your pals. Some new guy doesn't know Jack wants to waste your lieutenant, the whole damn platoon. Very powerful, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, my control movement was telling me that uh, we're out of time, but I think that's a um, good way to end uh, this session, part two. Mark, Mark Levy has been my guest, and uh, you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.